Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through Gary's Appendix, a thoughtful zine for old school essentials, issues one through five. Now, this is a fantastic set of PDFs, a fantastic zine that you can get over on DriveThruRPG, issues one through four at least. Now I just kickstarted issue five, so I don't know if it's out yet, but I'm going to be covering it anyway. These are great. They are full of really cool ideas. Um, as you'll see, each of them is formatted in a similar way. There are creatures and ideas about creatures and stat blocks and things like that. But then there's also just a bunch of, you might say, essays uh, and tables and thoughts on how to use different aspects of the game in each of them. I really like them. Now, they're each just issues one, two, uh, three four, and five. The art on the covers are awesome, as you guys can see. I'll go through them in more detail. The art for the books is incredible. Sometimes it's public domain, sometimes it's not. I really, really like the art in these zines. Again, each of them is 52 pages, so they are very consistent. Uh, no, actually, I should say, sorry. Three of them are 52 pages, two of them are 48 pages, so slight variation. But these are excellent, excellent zines. Let's go through the first one and give you a sense of what's in it. Uh, you have the you know, the people who are involved in this. Jeffrey Jones uh, is the, seems like the main overall editor, uh, main writer. But a lot, of, you know, a lot of people went into working on this. Uh, the contributors here, and where you get all of the uh, art and the illustrations and things like that too, so you can follow those. Great uh, breakdown of what's in the book. No hyperlinks, but that's fine. It's not a very long document. So you have in this one, one of the things I really like about each of these issues is that in the bestiary, you have a breakdown of the basic creatures from old school essentials and you'll see it, it, each of the issues deals with a different uh, going down alphabetically you start you start with acolyte in this one you go all the way down to boar and then the next one starts with what comes right after boar and continues on for another few creatures and so basically you get a bestiary of the creatures from old school essentials but it's not simply a bestiary you'll see that you have the basic stat blocks along with their special abilities an introduction to what they are and then ideas information about them and then how to use them in a game. Right? This is just one particular, um, one particular creature. Everyone that it presents in these books has a different kind of a block. So for example, that was the Acolyte. Now you have the ape or the white ape. Again, introductions, appearance, what they are like, what's you know, thing, interesting things about them, how to use them, and some possible scenarios in which you might find them. And so each of these creatures has a different kind of special thing that this scene deals with in relation to them. Bandits have reasons for their existence, different kinds of bandit groups, which is really cool. I like that a lot. Basilisks, and of course the basic ideas here, stat blocks, more expanded stat blocks, really cool ideas there. And then what the rewards might be for fighting them and some strange facts about them. Just basically great expansions of the monster manual for old school essentials. The great expansions for each of the creatures that you might run into. Even things like bats, right? <laughs> Giant vampire bats and normal bats and ways to use them bears, uh, beetles, <laughs> berserkers. Great ideas here. Uh, the black pudding, fantastic, fantastic thing. Its presence means, what does the presence of a black pudding mean in a particular dungeon? And of course it has the spore, so the, 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 the what is it, the, the idea that it's close or the, uh, the sign that it's close, each of them has a different one in the bottom right of each of these, so I really like that. Really cool, really, really cool. Then this is the first article of this scene, which is Unsettling Devotions, which are particular strange cults and things that are worshipped. Uh, Seekers of Nagalog is really creepy. I like that one a lot, what her followers like, and the song of Nagalog. Then you have the Disciples of Vermilion, uh, and the Maxim that goes along with them. Uh, Juntra, Deity of Law, Iconography of the Followers, and Juntra the Victorious Defeating Chaos. The League of the Heptagon. It's a demon and what it's going through and what's going on about it. So really cool ideas here. Chaos and Anatomy of Fun Encounters. So how to basically boost your encounters to make them more interesting. Um, different elements that you should consider if you want to make your encounters a lot more fun, a lot more engaging. So the setting of the encounter, environmental factors, monster actions besides just attacking, and set toys. Interesting things. In other words, um, you know, I, I really like the Rune Hammer Timer Threat and Treat. The three T's of any adventure. I really like that. But this seems to me to fit with the, mm, the, uh, the general idea of old school essentials, which is much more, you know, not necessarily big set piece battles, although you're going to have them from time to time, but making any encounter more interesting by rolling on the tables or just using them as ideas for how to make your own. 
how to put it all together. Wondering about wandering monsters, reasons to use wandering monsters. I really like this. Not every monster is a monster. What do monsters do? They convey information. They enhance immersion and believability. Novelty for the referee. You know, that's an important thing that a lot of times we forget. <laughs> uh, how to use them and how to roll for distance. Just basically taking the tables from old school essentials and expanding on them, explaining them. Really great ideas here. Why make custom tables? All of that. I, I really like this stuff. The costs of sage advice, right? A case for sages. Sages are one of those hirelings that I never really use. There's a great argument for them here and, and how to make them more interesting and how to expand the sorts of information that they can, the sort of information they can give and modifiers for their roles and things like that. Really cool stuff. So I, I really, really highly recommend this one too. And then there's the open gaming license. So you have just the first issue, great introduction to what the, ki the kinds of things you're gonna be running into in these zines. Issue two, I'm going to go through it again, that same sort of idea, great cover, I love it a lot. Um, the same idea, now you start with Blink Dog, right, you go through Brigands, Buccaneers, Bugbears, Cecilias, Carcass Crawlers, or Cecilias, I think it's Cecilias, the Carcass Crawlers, Cats, Great, and Centaurs. This one also has the idea of Language Tree, Gamifying Devotion, Flip the Script, and Gary's Guidance with some Sage Mages. So again, more ideas about how to use them, how came they hither, where, where, why are there Blink Dogs in your world? Brigands and a political slant, so maybe these are not just brigands, maybe there's something special about them. Buccaneers and a little zest to the buccaneers. Bugbears and, and how they work, could you use them as hireling sadistic monsters. Great ideas for all of these creatures in the monster manual. This idea of language trees. Basically, instead of just having a binary between a language or not having the language, not knowing it, you have this much more uh, expanded idea of you know, if you know this language, you have this chance of deciphering runes based on that language or understanding a few words in that other language. Basically, right, expanding the idea of languages out, making it a little more realistic, but also making it more practically useful so that either, you know, if the goblins are speaking and you speak Dwarvish, well, maybe you actually catch a glimpse of it, or maybe it, maybe the goblin uses Dwarven script, and so you, maybe you have a, a chance of recognizing something in, in goblin even if you don't speak it. That's sort of an example. But that's the idea of how to do it, and I really like that idea. Uh, I think I might adapt that or use that in my own games. Gamifying devotion, so how to make uh, monastic orders, clerics, paladins, or monks, and make it more concrete in-game, right? Make some particular things, uh, different vows that can be taken, obedience, consequences for obedience or disobedience. Uh, great piece of art there. Flip the script, this idea of script, which is a fiat currency, basically, paper money, and how you might use that in a game, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Uh, or token money, right, instead of actually money, which there were token monies in the ancient world, in the medieval world, so it's not something that is just completely modern. You could totally use that in one of your games. Gary's Guidance, and sandboxes, and how to use that. Basically just how to approach game mastering using uh, this sort of idea of the sandbox and the first adventure, just again, getting you right into it. Um, and then Sage Mages, the different kinds of mages you can use and magical research that can be done, the, the vellum script. I mean, just awesome stuff, awesome stuff for building your own books and all oh, that. That's a great one. Classic dungeon scenes from the Keep on the Borderlands. <laughs> I love that. So another fantastic little zine with great information. I, again, highly recommend all of these. I'm going to go through uh, the next one, which is issue three, because I, I really like issue three as well. Uh, it's all dealing with the undead, and I always like undead, especially since I'm running through my Curse of Strahd campaign right now, and we're almost, almost done. They've just ridden off to go to Ravenloft for the final, uh, well, I don't know if it'll be a final fight, but it'll be a final uh, progress through the dungeon, because they're going to try to find and kill Strahd, so that'll be interesting. Uh, so I might use some of this stuff here. There's another beast here. Again, it starts with a freeding, goes down to zombie. This one's focusing on the undead, so instead of just being alphabetical, but it's alphabetical in relation to creatures, monsters, right? Or undead, I should say. And you've got really good stuff. Plot hooks for each of these creatures. This one is set specifically as plot hooks for each of these kinds of creatures. Hellhound plot hooks, mummy plot hooks, or shadow plot hooks. Cool ideas, zombie plot hooks. A Brief History of Death. This is really cool. Folk tale customs for how people dealt with the dead and how they did funerals and stuff like that. Really cool ideas. Uh, the Hodag, which is a legend from the United States. Um, or rather, I should say, uh, right, there's the local creatures. Local creatures, folklore creatures. Um, awesome. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Creepy creature there. Legends of the Supernatural. 
It's super cool. So you get, again, inspiration from particular supernatural stories that you might run into across the world. The raised dead and how to use it properly and, and ways to make it more interesting than just a binary you cast it and it works. Salt and garlic and how this might work in a game. <laughs> Stir fry. Draugr, undead vikings and how you can use them in old school essentials. It's a great idea. And then again the open gaming license. So once again just a great collection of zines. This one's a little shorter, 48. But I like the stuff that's in here quite a lot. This is a really brief run through again, but I don't want to give you guys, I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a reason to buy these because they are, they're not pay what you want or free. They, they do cost money. I think it's $8 an issue, but I think it's worth it, especially if you're running a particular, if you're running a, a setting that has, that deals with one of the particular issues. Like for example, uh, issue four is all about sword and sorcery. And so again, again, the kind of creatures you're running into cave locusts down to dragon turtles, um, I guess that goes back to the alphabetical. <laughs> so it's not so much sword and sorcery there. But the sort of issue, uh, sorry, the sort of um, articles you're dealing with in this are much more sword and sorcery related, right? Creating sword and sorcery adventure, adventurous D&D and the sword and sorcery genre, the forge of the weapon master, how to do that. Welcome to the pleasure dome, encountering weather that is that distinct flavor and adding blood and thunder to your table. Great uh, issues with, again, creatures and how to build them, how to use them in your games. Fantastic stuff here. I really like books like this zines like this. Um, creating sword and sorcery adventures. How to do it. How to get that sword and sorcery tone at your table rather than high fantasy or kind of the more modern fantasy we're running into. I really like that great, uh, you know, it's hard in my experience, it's hard to do sword and sorcery right because I often slip right back into Tolkien fantasy or high fantasy, uh, but that's not exactly how I, you know, how I, uh, <laughs> how you, you do sword and sorcery. The Forge of the Weapon Master, cool weapons for a sword and sorcery game, like the Zweihander or the Aspis. Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. It's a great idea. Uh, basically like a sort of an arena and the games you could play in an ancient arena. Encountering weather, how to make weather interesting in the different um, different kinds of environments with, with, with challenges in each of those environments. That distinct flavor for sword and sorcery, so how to particularly bring it about, and then how to add blood and thunder into your table with some really good advice and ideas. Great piece of public domain art there as well. And I, I just love the covers. Now, some people are going to be like $8 for 58 pages. That seems kind of high. And I agree, but you have art. And the art in these books is very good and it's inspirational. It's you know Some of it's public domain, but not all of it. And those artists need to get paid. So, um, you know, I can see why it costs what it costs. Um, if you can get them on a sale, maybe that would be better. But if you, I would recommend getting them, just period. Now, this one, issue five, is the one that I kickstarted. And therefore, I don't know if it's available. It's certainly, I don't think it's on Drive RPG yet. It might be. Uh, I'll put links below to where you can get them all and this one if you can get it. Uh, but Appendix Issue 5 is great. This one deals with investigation-themed adventures, more wandering monster ideas, Legends of the Supernatural Part 2, and then Spies, World Building and Governments, and then What's in a Cube? So it deals with gelatinous cubes. I love gelatinous cubes. And so not only do you get one in the table of contents, but you get a whole section devoted to it at the end. And I love that. <laughs> Giant centipedes, crocodiles, uh, driver ants, dryads, and then of course the beautiful gelatinous cube and a great piece of art for that gelatinous cube. It reminds me, I have a gelatinous cube die that I love. Um, and it looks a little bit like that, <laughs> except for it's, it's really big and it's green. Uh, I love it. Uh, great ideas about how to use gelatinous cubes and you have gnolls and how to bring them in, harpies, hydras, and then investigation-themed adventures, which is hard to do as well. I you know that's something that I don't often do terribly, terribly well. But good, good advice for how to do an investigation-themed adventure. In a case for use of, uh, for using wandering monsters, another sort of issue on that point. And I, I agree with it. I think the advice in here is really, really good. But one bit of advice that I think is actually important for the right kind of game, although I'm not sure I fully agree with it for other kinds of games, is the never let chance be the final arbiter. So sometimes you can shift what the players encounter based on how, um, you know, basically just roll carefully, or if they roll, maybe shift things around or do. That's fair, but I talked about this in my Old School Essentials video. Like, you need things to be consistent. You really do. And if they're not consistent, the players will figure it out, and then it will change the tone of the table. So you got to be careful about modifying things like this carefully yeah it just um that doesn't say of course like if you're traveling in the safe sanctuary of an empire the die indicates wandering monsters ignore it 
that's totally fair. I don't mind that sort of thing where you're like, no, it's... Um, but, I don't know, slattering a party that's playing well just because the dice indicated three wandering monster encounters in a row is uncalled for. I don't know. I don't think that's true. I, well, at least, again, for certain tables and for certain, uh, certain settings and certain kinds of games. I actually think that if the players... I mean, granted, if it's just really unlucky, that, you know, that sucks, and there's not much you can do about it, but I am just not in favor of fudging the dice on, in an old school game, especially a dungeon crawl game, I'm not in favor of fudging the dice to fix the encounters of the player survive, you know, in any way. If, if they get unlucky and they die, they got unlucky and they died and they make new characters, it's not the end of the world. That's sort of how I think of it. But, you know, that's, again, that's going to be totally up to the table and the players and the GM and, and the kind of game you're running and everything, you know. Ultimately, as he points out, or as the author points out, the idea of role-playing games is to have fun. That's true. And if your table would not have fun doing this, then don't do it. That's, or, and if they would have fun doing this, then do it. <laughs> that's basically it. Uh, maximize the fun at the table. That's the, that's the best advice. Right? There, there was a saying for a while that I liked, which was fun trumps story trumps rules. Right? Fun trumps story trumps rules. Yeah, I think that's totally true. Um... Legends of the Supernatural, another one of these ideas of creatures that you might, you know, cool folk tales that, that you can draw inspiration from. Rules for hiring a spy, how to do all of that. I think some really good advice there, too. Uh, world building and governments, <laughs> great advice there as well. And then the what's in a cube. I love this, love this, love this, love this. Um, tables, probably more detailed than you care to imagine for what exactly is in the guts of a gelatinous cube. That is a great idea with some good tables for it and an insanely awesome piece of art here at the end. I love that. Gelatinous Cube Escape by Dean Spencer. I love that piece so much. It actually, in my opinion, it makes the Gelatinous Cube super menacing. Something like the Blob. I love that. Very often, Gelatinous Cubes are kind of just silly, or at least my players have often found them to be silly, even if they're deadly, because it's just like this big translucent cube of goo, and it's like, okay, I ran right into it. It's kind of a funny encounter in a lot of ways. But if you think about it, it's actually pretty horrifying, and I like this piece of art because it really does emphasize that. It's actually kind of traumatic, even though it's called escape, which means the guy's getting away. Still. And then a great use of public domain art there at the end. Gary's Appendix is a collective effort uh, by a creative menagerie to create a memorable zine for fantasy gamers. And I think absolutely that is a success. So Gary's Appendix issues one through five. Highly recommend, especially if you can get them on sale. Eight dollars is a lot for what you're getting, 50 pages. For I mean, each zine is eight dollars. But if you have one in particular that has stood out to you, one in particular that you like, or that deals with a sort of some, a creature that you're going to be using in, uh, primarily in your game, or something like that, then I'd highly recommend picking them up. And especially if you can get them on a sale, if they're you know 25% off, if they're 50% off, if you can get the, if, but four dollars, these would be a steal for each, I think. Eight dollars is right on the limit where I think I I'm going to get them because I'm a crazy collector, especially for old school essential stuff, and I like what's in there. But I can see some people saying, nah, not for me. $8 per issue is just a little too much. Um, so take that for what you will. I highly recommend them, and the contents are really, really good. I will put links below to where you can get them. All right, guys, I hope this has been interesting, and I will see you in another video.